<laughs> I had a little song I was going to sing before I started reading and I forgot what it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, excuse me, I'll try it next time. <laughs> anyway, it's scripture reading God's Word today is in Mark 15, 24 through 32. <clears throat> and they crucified him, divided up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each one, each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice on the, <coughs> the written notice of the charges against him read, "The King of the Jews." They crucified him, two rebels with him, one on each side, <coughs> and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their head and saying, "So you are." going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priest and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let his Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified him with also leaped insults on him. So be it. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that these are not only words that we hear, but words to live by, words that come from, from you, Lord, as a love letter, because you love us so much that you would be willing to sacrifice your own son's life to save us because you want a relationship with us. Father, we just thank you and praise you. Open up our eyes and ears to hear your word and to see the, the spiritual truths, Lord. And not only to just know these things, but to hide your word in, in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, to become a servant, to give up the things of this world, whatever it is to follow after Jesus, to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as we love ourselves. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going over the Gospel of Mark, if you didn't know it, if, and if you haven't looked at your calendars or you haven't started, you should be starting Hebrews. Hebrews is going to give you this tying together of the Old Testament to the New Testament and how Christ fits in there, how it's all about Jesus. Um, then we move into James, because if you say that you're a Christian but you don't live like a Christian, James basically says, I don't believe you. And then we're going to go into Ephesians, this who you are in Jesus Christ, the physical and spiritual battle that we, that we should face, and then what our hope is as we imitate and live like Christ in this world. To remind you, John Mark wrote through the eyes of Peter, more than likely, to the Roman Empire where you've got to decide who is your king. Who do you pledge allegiance to? Is it Caesar? Is it the things of this world? Or is it Jesus and the things that are not of this world? You do pledge allegiance to one or the other. You do serve one kingdom or the other. And as I told you, Caesar himself was presented before Jesus was presented as being the one that would save the world. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Mark began his gospel in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. When Jesus began his ministry, I think it's in verse 15, I don't have it here in front of me, he says, repent and believe the gospel, the good news. And as you read through Mark, you see that Jesus is, is a suffering servant, that he's humble, kind, and meek, that he has come to give sight to those who can't see, to give hearing to those who can't hear, not just physically, but spiritually. 
so that they would become a servant also. Not just so that you would believe and be saved, but so that you would follow after Jesus. And when you get to that center portion, chapter 8, and you get the kind of the dividing portion there where, where Peter says who Jesus is, but still stumbles because he's still... Am I okay now? Yes. Okay. Because he d uh, proclaims who Jesus is, but then he has the mind and intentions of Satan right after that in stopping Jesus from laying down his life. But then we get to what Jesus says plainly. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to be his disciple, if you believe the gospel message, anyone who wants to do that must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after Jesus. A life that says your life is not your own, that it is bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You should have read this week the passion that Jesus had laying down his life for you. And I hope you spent time meditating on that. Not just the physical abuse that he went through, but the mental abuse. And the fact that he was separated from God. When darkness fell upon the land, darkness engulfed because the light of this world was being extinguished physically. But the light of this world came back to shine and we are to shine like Jesus. And during that time, the temple veil was torn so that we have access to where only the high priest had to the Holy of Holies. You have access to God through Jesus Christ. Wow. When you talk about Jesus, you should just boil over with God's love poured out onto you. As we got to Mark chapter 8, Jesus warned in verse 15, Be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod, because religion will teach you that there are other ways, that they'll distort the gospel message, and then the kings of this world will definitely teach you other ways. And they'll provide the things for you that the church should be providing for you. They'll be providing for your needs so that you put your trust and hope in them, in kings and kingdoms. Verse 16, they discussed with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. They still saw physically. Verse 17, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls of pieces that, that were picked up? Did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketful of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? We watched the gospel presentation of Mark Friday night here. Had a little technical difficulty. And the section that we missed is kind of where I, I told you I'd probably close. It's that rich ruler. It's a passage that I struggle with all the time. Because Jesus says, go sell everything that you have and come and follow me. But see, it's not about whether you sell everything. It's not about what you do. It's where your heart is focused. That ruler walked away that day because his heart was not focused on Jesus. He had other loves, other desires. Jesus died for you to save you. His love for you is unconditional, un unimaginable, unfathomable. I can't say the words even right. I just get so excited. It is beyond any kind of measure that God would become flesh and die for me that I could spend eternity with Him. Is that how you feel? Uh, this mark, not that one, this one said, I liked it. It was right on the money. And no, I'm not trying to misquote you at all. But Jesus was a mean Jesus. Angry Jesus. That's why I said I didn't want it. But when you look at what he dealt with, yeah. <laughs> he constantly dealt with the harassment from the religious leaders, everything else, the people that just wanted their stomachs fed, and from the disciples that he had spent three years with that constantly could not get the fact 
that He was trying to save them spiritually. I mean, even when Jesus ascended, they said, Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? We see with our eyes. And every time that there's something we don't like in our lives, we want to say, Why me? What's the purpose of this, Lord? Rather than, Whatever your will is, Father, let it be done. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said when He went and prayed in the garden? You do realize that He said, Take this cup from me. He didn't say, Will you take this cup from me? He said, take this cup from me, Father, but not my will, but your will. That's how emotionally distraught Jesus was. We know that he sweated. His sweat had drops of blood in it because he was in such duress. But he wanted to save you and I. That was his mission. That was his love. That's what drove him because that is God and he was God and he is God. And he will never ever forsake those who believe in Him. Mark, Mark wrote that strange miracle of giving sight and that strange miracle of giving hearing which involved spit. As you read the, uh, the gospel through, you'll notice that Jesus was spit upon. Mankind spit upon Him, but yet He used spit to cure our sight and our hearing. You know what spit does? Without spit, you'd have dry mouth. Yeah, of course. It would be uncomfortable, but you couldn't taste and you wouldn't begin the digestion process. Jesus was saying, let me help you hear. Let me help you see so that you don't go through this world and not believe, but besides that, believe and not be a servant, not live a life of worth, not here when you get to meet him face to face. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The gospel that's presented in Mark is clear. Jesus laid down his life to save you and he's called you to do the same. So what in the world does that look like? Am I supposed to sell everything? What, 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 would, what would I choose over Jesus that day? That's why I go back to that passage all the time. It's not about money. It's not about family. It's not about power. It's about who is the love of your life. And would anything cause you to walk away? That man looked like if anybody was going to have eternal life, anybody was going to go to heaven, it was going to be him. But Jesus knows your heart. Is there anything that you love more than Jesus? Peter declared, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. That was to the question that Jesus asked. He asked who. Yours might be broken down in three, but there's two primary statements there. Who do others say that I am? And then that doesn't matter at all. What matters is who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you? And you see the struggle with Peter. You've seen the struggle with Peter throughout uh, the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 4, Peter said this. He said, Jesus, verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby they might be saved. You know, Peter's quoting Psalms 118 here, and we'll get to that a little bit in a minute because Jesus, if you didn't catch it, quoted from Psalms 118 also. Peter quotes verse 22. Jesus quotes verse 22 and 23. <clears throat> Jesus said these same words in Mark 12. He gave a parable about some wicked farmers. He said, what then will the owner... This is in verse 9. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage from Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, I don't know if, if you're there in the Bible. If you turn there, that's Mark 12, verse 11. Yours may have a question mark. Walt and I were talking about that a little bit this morning. No punctuation in the original but you can get inflections. You can look at what, who Jesus is talking to, how he's asking or stating the statement. Peter said that Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. 
Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. These are the same words Jesus quoted here. He said, haven't you heard this passage of Scripture? They were familiar with it. And we're going through Psalms now also as a daily devotion. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the people of Israel who have not recognized that He's the Messiah. He is talking to the people of Israel who have not used wisely what God has given them as children of the Most High that they are to worship the Lord their God. Hear, O Israel, the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God. Love others. Let your light shine to others so they may see God, the mighty works of God. Again, the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt so that they could worship God, that they could rejoice. And what did they do when they got out into the wilderness? They mumbled and groaned and complained. They were going to a land filled with vineyards and with houses that they didn't build, but yet they grumbled and complained along the way. <laughs> Do I see any resemblance in my life? Do you see any resemblance in your life? Jesus says to these same people, you are tenant farmers. You have a responsibility. Don't you know the Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. I am the one. No doubt about it. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Question mark. Because Jesus is asking here, do you not understand this? David, if David wrote Psalm 118, we don't know for sure, wrote it as a statement because he knew God. This is marvelous in my eyes. Jesus asked it here, this is marvelous in your eyes? Is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, marvelous in your eyes? Because if you see clearly, if you hear God's words of love, there is no greater love, Jesus said it, than a man laying down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for anyone who would believe. While he laid it down, he laid it down silently before his enemies. The same people that on Palm Sunday said, Hosanna, which means save us. And on Friday were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Even Rome asked, don't you want me to release Jesus? And they, the people shouted out even the more, release this insurrectionist who may have committed murder instead. Barabbas, whose name means son of the father in irony, because he's not the son of the father. Jesus is the son of God. What then will the owners of the vineyards do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyards to others. That's us, guys. Because of Israel's rejection, the gospel message was offered to the whole world. Beginning in Judea, to Samaria, to the utter ends of the earth. You and I. There's no difference between Jew or Greek. There are none righteous, no, not one. We are all wretched, pitiful, naked, blind, deaf. And Jesus has come to cure all that and give us eternal life so that we could proclaim God's love, His glory, His grace, His mercy. Have your eyes and your ears been opened? Do they sing the praises of God through Jesus Christ? Mark 8, verse 34 to 35 gives this invitation to all. Then he called the crowds along, to, and, along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever, wants to lo whoever loses their life for me and for the sake of the gospel will be saved. Debbie had us sing a song about being a servant of all. Hopefully you saw that pattern in there. That Jesus said, if you understand this, God built you with a desire to want things, 
to be successful, to even accumulate things. Don't take me wrong here in saying this, because I'll say it to where it begins, to points now. It's the Creator, not the creation. He created you with that desire so that you would desire Him more than you desire anything else. And if you'll just taste and see, that's why that spit's involved with Jesus, you'll start to taste and digest how good the Word of God is, how much He loves you, how Jesus is the Word made flesh, how He is the light of the world, and He has called you to be the light of the world. Verse 31 says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him. But Jesus turned and looked at His disciples. He rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in, my, in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You might be saved. You might, be, you might believe. You might spend eternity in heaven rather than that other place. But where is your heart focused? Where are your concerns focused? How many times have you said, Oh, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to do this. But today I need to go do this. But you, you know I love you, but I got to do this. And don't tell me you haven't. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that rich ruler that day walked away because he needed to do something else and invest a little bit and then sell. I don't know. I know from other Gospels that Jesus said that you can't take time to do anything when Jesus calls you, follow Him. And when you put your hand to the plowshare, don't ever look longingly back. Jesus said He had come to cause division even between mothers and daughters, fathers and sons. His love, his, your affection for Him, your love for Him cannot be less than anything else. It needs to be the greatest thing. It has to be the greatest thing. As you read chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, you read that passion of Jesus Christ. So I ask you the statement that Jesus said again from Psalm, 18, Psalm 118, 23. Is this not marvelous in your eyes that God would lay down His life in such a way to save you. Let's read Psalm 118. I'm going to start in verse 17 so you can get the gist of that psalm. The people of that day knew these words that Jesus was quoting. They knew when Peter quoted them in Acts. Starting in verse 17, I will not die but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done could stop there again, couldn't I? Because I have eternal life, because I believe in Jesus Christ, how could I not proclaim? Verse 18, The Lord has chastened me severely, but He has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may in enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The next words are... The stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Remember I told you that that's exactly what the people declared when Jesus come in. Hosanna, which means save us now, Lord. <clears throat> but they later cri cried, crucify Him, crucify Him. The Lord has done this this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With boughs in his hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The psalmist is writing this and saying, to join in the processional that binds the sacrifice to the altar. Jesus died for you. Every one of you. 
We were His enemies, Scripture says, when He died for us. Maybe this will help you, maybe this won't help you, but you literally bound Jesus to the cross. You had to. Jesus had to die for you. He took your sin, your shame, your judgment, the life that you used to live, and nailed that all upon the cross. He became a curse. Cursed is any man who hangs on a tree so that the curse of sin would be lifted from your lives. This is the gospel, the good news. Here are some Mark's words from chapters 14 and 15. You won't be able to follow me along. Okay? If you want to close your eyes, if you don't, just listen and hear these words. Let them go in your ears and not go out the other ear, but absorb them. Listen to them. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you will. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the, hand of the uh, hands of sinners. Then everyone deserted him and fled. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they could not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, Jesus said. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, the irony in that. They spit in, on him and then blindfolded him, where Jesus spit in the eyes to give sight. They struck him with their fists and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. After a while, little while, though standing <clears throat> near, said to Peter, Surely you are one of them. You are a Galilean. He began to call down curses. And he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman authority. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he commanded, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a, corn of, a, thorn, a crown of thorns, thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff, and they spit on him. Falling on <coughs> their knees, they paid sarcastic homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him, and they crucified him, dividing up his clothes, and they cast lots to see what each other would get. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews... What irony there. The Roman authority was the authority that had the power to kill him and the authority that put the charge over him, which was simply, you're the king of the Jews. <laughs> they crucified two rebels with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down off that cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabbat. Sabachthana, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn, from to torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, 
He said, Surely this man was the Son of God. A declaration of who Jesus Christ is. Mark made it as a believer in the beginning of his gospel. Jesus said, Repent and believe this good news, the gospel. And now Rome declares, Surely this man was the Son of God. And if you notice, Jesus didn't die. No one took his life. He gave his life. He gave up His Spirit to His Father to save you. Jesus willingly sacrificed His life to save you. Psalms 118 says, This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the corner, cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in my eyes. You and I bound Jesus to the cross. Not that we could, but that our sins caused Him to submit His life, to humble His life, to lay down His life as a sacrifice to save us. And as a shepherd, He wants to lead you. And if you are His sheep, you listen to His voice. You do not li listen to another. You let Him spit in your eyes and your ears if necessary so that you can taste and see that the Lord is good, so that you can hear the words of the Lord and obey them. And Jesus calls us to humbly serve Him, to feed ourselves spiritual bread, and to give others the spiritual bread that they need to have eternal life. Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Before that spit miracle of the death of the mute man in Mark 7, there was a woman with a child. And I don't want you to miss these inferences to children and to service. In Mark 7, verse 26, the woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want. Children. Because adults have got to say to themselves, I'll eat what I want to eat, Lord. But children eat what you put in front of their plates. At least they do in my household. <laughs> First let the children eat, for it is not right to take the children's bread, think spiritually, and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Without that bread that Jesus is offering, people would not come to life. Because of Israel's rejection, then the whole world gets to come to Jesus and anyone who believes must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Jesus. Then he told her, verse 29, For such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. Because of her faith, saying, Just give me the crumbs of bread that you're offering Jesus. Her daughter was healed from the demonic influence that was in her life. You know the things that happened in Mark 8. We talked about them last week, the feeding of the 4,000. And then uh, Jesus told them to be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees and of, the, of Herod. And then we have another spit miracle. We went over that. In Mark chapter 9, you have the transfiguration so that they can see the glory of Jesus. <clears throat> and then there's a father that brings his son to be healed. Did you catch that? Who did he bring the son to? The church. He didn't bring him to Jesus. Jesus has been transfigured. Peter has saw his glory. Peter doesn't understand still. And in Mark 9 verse 35, Jesus says, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last a servant of all. Jesus drives out demons. He gives sight to the blind so that they can see. 
He gives hearing to the deaf and mute so that they can hear and speak. And He calls us, His disciples, to do the same. In Mark 10, people were bringing little children to Jesus. This is verse 13. To place His hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, He was indignant. He was mean, Jesus. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter. And he took the child in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. You have to go back and think about the culture of that day too. Children belong to their parents. The father of that family had every right to do whatever he wanted to with that child. We don't understand that. And that man who had a child that had had a demon in him from the beginning of, would probably have just got rid of that child. But that father loved that child. And he asked Jesus' followers to cast out that demon. And they couldn't. Because they lacked faith and they lacked prayer in this instance, Jesus told them also. Jesus, after this, tells for the third time about his suffering that he's going to go in, going to partake in. And he said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You remember that. But he also talks about anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. And if anyone causes one of these, little ones to stumble. It would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and thrown in the sea. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Maybe you didn't see this out of the Gospel of Mark. Maybe you didn't see the child relationship and the servant relationship and the mother and the daughter and the father and the son. But here's the deal. The problem that we have in our lives is sin. You've heard me say this before. And the problem in the word sin is I right in the middle of it. That it needs to be replaced with the letter O so that you're dependent on the Son of God rather than dependent upon yourselves and what you think. Because unless you come to Him like a little child and say, Lord, I am yours, then there's a good possibility that you really don't believe the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't know how to say it any clearer than that. Because if you believe the good news, Jesus means everything to you. That's why when that young rich ruler came... Peter and the disciples were amazed that this guy walked away. So I ask you, what loves are in your life? That's why Jesus goes on to say, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at His words, but Jesus said again, children, children, How hard is it for you to enter the kingdom of God? He wants you to have that mentality as a child has that comes to you to be fed, to be nourished, to be clothed, to enjoy the things of life. When you throw them up in in your arms, they know that you're going to catch them. And it's fun because I trust in my dad. Children, how hard it is. God made you with the passions and desires that you have. But things will not make you happy. It doesn't matter what they are. Jesus will make you happy in any circumstance that you ever face. He will give you peace beyond any understanding if you'll just trust in Him. One needs to come to Jesus as a child, believing, loving, trusting, and totally dependent. Will you come to Jesus today? On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. 
If you ask this world, this country today, the church, the crowds, whoever, who Jesus is, you'll get a way variety of answers. The uncommon answer you'll hear is that He's my everything. He's the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and I serve Him. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Got a little poem that I kind of took the idea from somewhere else, but then wrote. I'm going to close with it. Lord, why would you give up heaven and take on flesh? So that I could live a life in exchange for thee. Lord, why would you let your enemies take you captive? so that the devil will not hold you captive and take you with him into total darkness. Lord, why did you let them bind you to a tree so that you could be loosed from the curse of sin and its power that has you in bondage? Lord, why would you let them lift you up on a cross so that I may lift you up to new life now and forevermore? Lord, why would you let them drive nails in your hands and feet so that you would see how to give with your hands and walk in a way that follows me. Lord, why would you let them spread your arms so wide so they would be wide enough to embrace all who believe? Lord, why would you let them pierce your side so that you could come near to my heart and forever be? Lord, why would you forsake your only son and let him die? Because once you were blind, but now you see. Father in heaven, we thank you for the passion of Jesus, the good news, the gospel, that God loves the world so much that he would give his one and only son to save them, to give them new life, to give them an eternal home with you, and to be the light of this world that shines before men. Lord, may our lives be that kind of life that shows your glory, your love. May we praise you. May we not have other loves before you, other, other gods before you. Lord, examine our hearts, O oh Lord. Use the spit where you need to use the spit. Use whatever you need to use, Lord. We thank you for what Jesus Christ willingly, passionately did for us. We praise you because of him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.